right, GM, everybody, how are we feeling? Awesome, thank you so much for being with us here today. My name is Evan McMullen, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Disco, where we believe that you are the multifaceted center of the party, just as you are, and you should reflect your data and your identity to the world however you choose. I am so thrilled to be here today with Jaya Brecky and Chelsea Manning from NIM, the Global Decentralized Privacy Project. Chelsea Manning is a whistleblower, veteran, security engineer at NIM, and occasional DJ. She has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize and received the EFF Pioneer Award in recognition for her actions as a whistleblower and for her work as an advocate for government transparency and transgender rights. Jaya is the Chief Strategy Officer at NIM. She is also a research fellow at the Weizenbaum Institute, has a PhD from Durham University a Geography Department on the Politics of Blockchain Protocols, and is an occasional expert advisor to the European Commission on Distributed Ledger Technology. She speaks rights and conducts research on privacy, power, and the political economies in decentralized systems. So in light of this week's developments in our Ethereum ecosystem, I'm especially excited for us to discuss the role of consent and privacy amid the scaling of our world's most public ledgers. In contrast to the transparency of networks like Ethereum, NIM's privacy infrastructure enables the secure transmission of data using network protocols that obscure individuals' metadata footprints, coins, and wallets. So Jaya, can you uh, kick off by telling us a little bit more about NIM? What are Mixnets and what inspires you about the future enabled by these routing protocols? Sure. Um, so yeah, so NIM, the core technology of NIM is a Mixnet. And what a Mixnet does is it takes uh, traffic in the internet and it mixes it together. So it takes everybody's traffic, mixes it across three uh, layers of nodes. Um, and adds micro time delays and basically ensures that patterns of communication cannot be uh, discerned from, um, from observing the entire network. Um, and this is important for a variety of different reasons because um, when you can see the patterns of communication, you can discern a lot about people's relationships. Um, so what a mixnet does is it protects uh, you know, both things like IP addresses, but importantly also um, metadata. Um, and exactly, you know, patterns of, of communications. So, um, what that what that means, uh, I think, what people oftentimes don't understand is, you know, encryption is is not enough. Um, you can send, you know, encrypted messages back and forth, but just by looking at the timing, you know, what time of the day you send the message, or uh, the size of the message. Um, the message data, you can actually understand quite a lot about what's going on and the nature of a person's relationship. So say, for example, you, are, you happen to be sending a message to you know, someone else um, at you know, 10 o'clock at night on a regular basis. It's quite likely to be quite a personal relationship. Um, and there's, you know, from there, you can do all kinds of analysis uh, using new types of surveillance that's uh, you know, operated through uh, machine learning algorithms that really gives quite fine-grained information um, despite the content of the messages being hidden. Um, so that's essentially you know, a kind of quick explanation of Mixnets. Um, it is, a, uh, importantly, also a collective approach to, to securing privacy. Um, and, you know, which is kind of important also on kind of a deeper philosophical level because when we're dealing with the situation like today where we have mass surveillance, we really need to start thinking about mass privacy systems as well, right, to address the fact that um, the way surveillance operates uh, in a kind of, in our contemporary world has less to do with looking at, you know, someone spying on a specific individual and has much more to do with what does the collective data scape reveal about any given individual at any given moment. So even if I, as an individual, protect my privacy, um, the behaviors of people around me will still reveal a lot about me. So, you know, that's why we need a kind of collective approach to privacy. That's why we need, you know, things like mixed nets to actually address this problem at that level. Chelsea, why NIM? What experiences have you had and um, what is it about the state of the privacy tech ecosystem that led you to this particular project? Right, so NIM, uh, man, I mean, well, I'll just start from the beginning. So basically, Harry Halpin, who is our, um, who's the person who 
really started uh, and uh, put NIM together as an actual project, even though it had been thro- flo- thrown around, f- thrown around and floated around a bit um, by a number of uh, privacy experts over the years. Um, he's actually started. He actually formed the corporation and uh, and raised funding to be able to to make this happen um, independently. Uh, I th- several people came up with the same sort of idea of c- creating a mixed net, which is uh, if you think if you think of how Tor works um, as a, a, a as sort of a uh, mixing uh, and a um, uh, a connection like hop, uh, you know, an, an anonymizer between different connections, um, a mixed net adds an additional shroud. Uh, an additional layer of protection around the packets of data. And so I, in 2016, uh, independently came up with a sort of proposal for uh, how to do, a, for how to create a, a mixed net along with uh, Jan uh, Zhu, the, uh, uh, known as at, at Bcrypt on, on uh, Twitter. Uh, and uh, we, we both worked on this together uh, just to sort of like throw, you know, um, spaghetti, spaghetti on the wall, per, uh, proposal for what would be would we would do, expect if we were to improve upon the existing infrastructure of something like Tor or uh, the the existing VPN infrastructures that you that, that you see out there. Um, what is unique about NIM, though, uh, f- in comparison to other mixed nets, is that it has this additional layer, which is the blockchain aspect of it, which is designed to incentivize. Um, people to run nodes and to be rewarded for running those nodes. So while a user doesn't necessarily need to know anything about uh, tokens or blockchains or wallets or anything like that, people who run nodes on the network will most certainly you know, need, need to and, and will benefit from an understanding of how, of how, my, of, of sort of how, how the, the proof of mixing works because it's unlike proof of stake or proof of, uh, or, or proof of mining, um, you have proof of, you have proof of mixing, which is a, uh, a, a way of being rewarded tokens for contributing to the mixing process across the network because the math involved in running a mix net with uh, a s- secure enough level of encryption fast enough across the network is going to require an enormous amount of computational energy uh, and, and time and effort um, and it needs to be distributed across the entire network. So uh, in order to do that, you need a sort of incentive structure that isn't, mon- that isn't based on existing monetary structures, that isn't based on existing, um, uh, you know, uh, institutional frameworks or anything like that. So, so that way a particular region doesn't get uh, prioritized over another, um, you know, especially for, a, you know, trying to defeat censorship and things like that. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, you know, it's all of these different things are really solved by, um, by this stack of solutions, this infrastructure approach um, by, Trying to secure internet, the try, trying to secure internet, internet-like um, protocols, uh, HTTP-type protocols, your messenger-type protocols, uh, your transaction, your your you know um, your cryptocurrency transaction-type protocols, all across you know a, a, an agnostic environment. Um, and be able to communicate with each other privately and securely at the infra- uh, but with the with this at the infrastructure level at the low at as low as a level as we can get it to, to be possible um, so that way we can ensure that all of these communications can be private and secure and also come rel- relatively fast um, maybe not uh, maybe not fast in the beginning but later on down the line they can be fast so yeah that was what draw that that's what drew me to this project to this project is that you know, NIM isn't going to solve anything immediately. It is a long-term project. This is this is a at least a decades long. You know, this is a decade long, maybe maybe even longer, sort of larger, grander project to really rethink privacy uh, privacy technology, privacy infrastructure. So, privacy infrastructure is not often something that we talk about in rooms like this where we are relying on the open transparency of our public ledgers. Well, Um, they should. We absolutely should. And that's why I'm so glad that we are here having this discussion with so many people in a position to be able to operationalize these ideas. 
Um, so, you know, some of you may have, have heard me describe public ledgers as equal opportunity surveillance apparatuses, which is a phrase that, phrase that I, I learned from Chelsea earlier this year. Yes. And I think about it daily when pushing transactions to networks like Ethereum, where my interactions will be available to everyone on Earth and in space with an internet connection until the heat death of the universe. Uh, quite the opposite of what we might think of as private um, you know, in, in Web3, uh, you know, based on the, the quotes around the halls of this building and the way that we lead ourselves in the world, we follow in the footsteps of the cypherpunk movement. Um, but, you know, Chelsea, what does it mean to anchor social and political change in the technologies of cryptography and privacy? In, you know, in your opinion, what are cypherpunk values and why are they so important for us to consider right now? Uh, it's it's actually a dichotomy, right? You know, you have this this these two poles, which are privacy and openness, right? They're two opposites, right? You want as much individual privacy as possible, and you want as much societal openness as possible in that. So it's really um, about u utilizing technology, utilizing math, utilizing. Um, you, you, an understanding of information in the universe and the, the sort of economics of, and the, the thermodynamics and the entropy of the entire universe and understanding all of these different principles and applying it to trying to come up with uh, a, a new or uh, at least a more enlightened approach towards operating or envisioning your society of running. You know, so it, it is really about um, trying to find that balance between your privacy as a as, as an individual and as a and, and and as a smaller collective as a community, and the sort of greater good of you know society having openness and transparency and you know open communication, open debate, open dialogue, etc. So it's it's very it's a very difficult um, it, you know it's very difficult to define because. These, these, there are so many forces uh, within the sort of movement that are polar opposites, really. Um, I would like to add a little bit more to that as well. Like, I think the interesting thing about cypherpunk thinking is that there is actually a, a kind of embedded analysis of power. Um, and that embedded analysis of power can enable us to think through the relationship between privacy and openness in quite useful ways. Um, so one of the kind of like old school sayings of uh, cypherpunk culture is um, transparency for the powerful and privacy for the rest of us. Yeah. Right? And um, as a principle, I think that's it, it can be a very kind of useful way to think through what is the role of public ledgers um, also in relation to the people that then go about using them. Right. Um, so, you know, I think. Typically speaking, when we think about transparency for the powerful, uh, privacy for the rest of us, we might have an idea of who the powerful are, being you know, governments, corporations, the usual kind of cliches. Um, but actually, when we're going about building alternative futures and we're going about building decentralized systems, uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done there around you know, who is the powerful and who is the rest of us in, in that scenario, right? Um, and the way that we kind of think about that within NIM is, is actually that when you're operating with a decentralized infrastructure and people become increasingly dependent on that decentralized infrastructure, it is in fact the infrastructure itself that becomes the powerful and the users of that infrastructure are the rest of us, right? And what that means in practice then is that um, the actual operators and the way the infrastructure operates needs to be transparent. And transparent in the sense of open source code, transparent in the sense of um, you know the power dynamics of like you know who who has the the highest hash rate and you know who are operating the main validators in the network and so on and so forth. That becomes very important to have you know as uh, open public information. Um, whereas the people that are actually interacting with the system, you know, that is the rest of us, and that's where we really need to start to secure people's privacy a lot better. Um, but I actually think that, generally speaking, there is uh, a little bit, there's too much of a lack of analysis of power in the space right now when it comes to exactly these questions. Um, who is, you know, who is the powerful, who is the rest of us, and what, you know, where, where should, how can we guarantee privacy for people that are interacting with the systems? I think a remarkable number of people in this room could be counted among the powerful in terms of the technical decisions that can be made <laughs> in this ecosystem. Um, well, I mean, just uh, that's that's another interesting point, right? Meaning that actually, like, 
you know, as human beings, we operate in different capacities, right? So sometimes we're the powerful and sometimes we're not. Um, and so there's, you know, again, there's a bunch of work to be done around like, okay, when you're, when you're coding a piece of infrastructure that other people are gonna depend upon, um, then yes, you are, you, you are in a position of power and you need to understand, you know, how you're actually, you know, executing that power and what that means for other people. Yeah, our, our roles, our identities are not fixed and public and permanent, right? We, you know, show up as in, in different capacities in different spaces and that flexibility is not offered to us by things like an immutable public ledger. Um, right before we got on stage, we're, we're looking at a tweet that said something to the effect of um, cryptocurrency is first, crypto country is next. How might we anchor the spirit of this intention, bringing people together in, in sort of the, the delight of these technologies, but how might we anchor that idea in cypherpunk values in a manner that is not going to um, overly empower the already powerful and limit us from having flexibility in our roles and how we show up? Okay, can I, can I take this for a minute? Immediately, yes. <laughs> um, Another tendency that I've seen in this space is that somehow, you know, there is, there is a tendency to reproduce existing dynamics in a decentralized form, right? So it's like, let's, uh, let's reproduce nation states, let's reproduce banks, let's reproduce the legal system, and we'll just do it in a decentralized network, which just seems like the biggest missed opportunity, right? If, you know, to actually have, uh, to move towards transformation of what these institutions look like, a different kind of thinking needs to take place. And that includes like throughout the entire spectrum, right? So we had a little bit of a conversation around identity earlier, where there is, you know, too much of a tendency for people to want to like, you know, put people's passports on public ledgers. And it's like, you know, and it, again, it's like this problem of like this, you know, how can we get out of the, the, the let's say the, the conditioning that we have um, from the institutions and the structures that we live in at the minute to really move forward into something that is truly new, a different set of, of uh, um, ways of organizing social relationships that actually make full use of the affordances of these technologies, right? Um, and that's where, you know, uh, selective disclosure credentials is much more interesting than, than uh, putting identities online um, because it's actually making use of, you know, the fantastic possibilities that we have with cryptography, right? It's pretty much my views as well, uh, summed up. Uh, I do think that, uh, I do think the existing infrastructure, um, whenever it comes to, and this, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I've been a critic of cryptocurrency in particular. Um, which makes me an outlier in this uh, in this area, but um, I have it's it's not that I'm not it's not that I was never excited about blockchain or that I was never excited about crypto or that I was never excited about these tools and the ability for innovation in the space. Um, I think that one of the problems that I've seen with cryptocurrency and with the the more recent sort of um, craze over NFTs is that um, it it it's really been something that has been benefiting incumbent uh, systems and incumbent powers and people who are already who are already benefit benefiting from these structures and already benefiting from the, from the existing sort of institutions who have uh, who have, have benefited the most thus far. Um, you know, there has been some outliers. There's been some people who have had uh, a unique opportunity and they've been able to take it. But um, the sort of culture around these around uh, uh, you know from about 2013 to about last year i'd say you know the culture of uh, of sort of the crypto space and the and you know became less about sort of the cypherpunk mentality and much more about like let's get rich let's make lots of money and it's going to be crypto money it's going to be tokens we're going to tokenize all of our assets and i don't think that that you know that i, I i've never really found that appealing because i just find that to be like a a, an approach towards, you know, um, reinstating a, a, a more um, a more libertarian, digitally libertarian form of capitalism, which you know uh, I, th I think has its own, in, you know, sort of uh, structural problems. Um, but that's getting into a lot of sort of higher theory and politics and things like that. For the, but for the for the moment, like I'm, I'm going to stick more to the technical things, which is that there are no technical limitations that say we need to reinstate existing in, in you know institutions and infrastructure there are these tools you know wh whether whether it's blockchain or whether it's a mixnet or whether it's uh it's it's any kind of uh 
technology, it's, you know, uh, machine learning. It doesn't, machine learning is outside of the space, but yeah, but yet, you know, like is, is something that is also like has an enormous potential for, you know, uh, being a liberatory or transformative force. And yet it's being used to, to train you uh, better, you know, to train algorithms to show more ads to you. Right. Um, and so, you know, I'm just, I'm just very alarmed at sort of the, the, the sort of the way that technologists have sort of given up or, you know, given into the existing infrastructure and the existing institutions a lot, um, you know, which, but I've been wanting to resist against that. And that's why I, you know, that's why I'm so excited about NIM. That's why I'm so excited about some of the newer projects that are coming in. And that's why, one of the reasons why I'm even here, you know, it's just because I see that there's a lot more potential for innovation now, especially in, in the crypto winter, so to speak. Yeah, it is incumbent upon us when the tokens are not just going up to not transpose the systems that already are in place and to further entrench people in positions of power, but rather to challenge, you know, what this looks like, even when our bags are still pretty, you know, looking pretty good. Um, so kind of to, to that end, um, the merge that we celebrated this week signals a way forward beyond protocol fetishists and techno- -utility. Proof of stake. Proof of stake. Sounds delicious. Um, but yeah, we're, we got to scale this stuff into the lives of everyday people. Uh, but, you know, as, as Ethereum scales post-merge and new users from around the world begin to venture into Web3, as we start to improve the user experience um, of, you know, our application layer and, and bring more non-financial utility into, into Web3, we must bring privacy to the forefront of this work. Um, so Jaya, how should builders prioritize privacy as our community matures beyond experiments and conjecture into global adoption? Um, from NIM's perspective, privacy needs to be there as the default. Um, and, you know, the kind of complicated element to that is the fact that that, that means across the, the entire stack, right? Um, and NIM is looking specifically at the network layer, and there's lots of other good projects out there that are looking at the application layer and, and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, there is the additional, there's, you know, additional complications around proof of stake, right, which I think like pe a lot of other people have been talking about, which is um, the, the question of validator privacy and how that opens up to, uh, you know, possible attacks. Um, and that's something that we're looking at at NIM, and we're doing a, a few experiments there to see how NIM can um, help that situation by protecting the IP addresses of validators. Um, but yeah, it's, it, if, you know, it's really, I think if we don't actually sol start solving these problems now, it's gonna have you know, some major, major problems, that are major, major issues down the line. Um, privacy needs to be built in by the default, as a default, and I mean, I'm hoping we can get into this a little bit more as we go along the conversation because I want to talk a little bit about what does that actually look like in terms of like the futures that we're building. Because um, there is a tendency to think about privacy very much as this protective thing. Um, but I actually think that it's, it's the precondition for a much more in, like, interesting innovation pathway. But I think we can get into that a little bit later. Yeah, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, uh, go ahead. So, um, you know, in, in Web3, we often hear people talking about, oh, we'll add privacy later. We need to prioritize data availability because that's what smart contracts need as inputs. Um, and we can consider the informed consent of our users and, and the parties interacting later on. Um, so, you know, as a, as a prompt, like, is informed consent and data availability, is that is that a set of two polar extremes? Is there a way in the middle that we can find where we can find compromise? Or is the importance of data availability to inform smart contracts just so valuable um, that that's something that we need to continue to prioritize? I mean, I have a ton to say on this. <laughs> um, I mean, the, here's the thinking, basically. Um, privacy to my mind, it, it's just like, it's the first step. Privacy is an intervention into the entire data pipeline from, my, from, from our opinion. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, there, is, there is a bit of a kind of, or a major misunderstanding about the nature of data, um, like in the first place. 
um, meaning that data is just this thing that's available, it's out there, it's kind of objective, we just grab it and then we use it for something and it's important, you know, and so on and so forth. But actually the production of data itself is already a political act in and of itself, is already a social act in and of itself. Um, the production of data is the production of knowledge and the production of knowledge is something that actually needs to be in the hands of communities themselves not something that is at random, totally just scraped from everybody's you know, digital interactions by you know, some megacorp somewhere and just sucked up and plugged into another machine. Like that is a form of knowledge that's not our knowledge. It's not our, the, a knowledge that we have control over and that we're kind of contributing to out of our own kind of uh, consensual you know, engagements with these technologies. So the way that I see um, the way that I see privacy is really as a kind of, it's almost a blockade. <laughs> it's almost like a, it's an intervention into the existing data economy, which is a surveillance economy, um, to say that we want a different form of knowledge production and we want a different pathway for innovation. And I think actually, like, um, rather than holding things back, it will produce a much more interesting form of innovation because it will, it, will, it will translate throughout the entire data pipeline all the way through to machine learning algorithms, right? Where all of a sudden, you know, people can have a say over uh, not just the data that gets produced about them, but how it then gets used later on, right? What kind of algorithms should be trained on this data? Why? Um, what are the data sets in the first place? You know, there's a, it becomes a much more, um, uh, let's say, involved and consensual form of, of innovation that can be in the hands and in the control of, of communities that are actually go, gonna go and use these technologies instead of things that are kind of being you know, force fed to us and used for, to capture people in infinite scrolls and, and ad clicking. Uh, this, goes, this goes back to another reason why I was gravitated towards getting involved in crypto again and being involved in NIM is because I, I've, I've been for the last five or so years in the machine learning space and in the, you know, uh, the, the weights and balances world, if you will. Uh, so doing the, uh, and in this space, um, where, where, you know, one of the things that, that, that has struck me uh, as being a problem and that, uh, as being a problem that, that tools like, uh, like NIM are vitally needed for to solve are, you know, we're, we're ending up in, in more and more situations where data collection is like, is like not something that is intuitively seen as something that needs to be private for certain data types. It's because it's not even just uh, metadata anymore. It's almost like meta metadata where it's like the amount, like a perfect example of this is TikTok, right? When you're on your phone using the TikTok app, every single microsecond that you're on the app is measured and every single interaction that you have down to the microsecond is like measured and, and they're able to determine how, your personality type, uh, your background, your age, your gender, your location, all of this data based on how little you don't or do interact with the video that is being shown at you at all times. So you're able to learn enormous amounts of information off of something that isn't intuitively understood to be private information. It's your watch time. And now we have tools that are, you know, coming into the pipeline where, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be, you, sh you should find it funny that you, all of a sudden, ever, everybody has, all these electronic devices have facial recognition and are able to really catch, you know, sort of the cues of your facial recognition your, and, uh, and what your, your face is doing at any given time. Because it's being, it's being prepared for, they're preparing you uh, for a time in which it is, it, you have to look at the phone and watch the ad. And it's going to, you know, the the your phone is going to determine, via, you know, via a facial recognition system, that you are in fact watching the ad for the entire for the entirety portion of the ad. If you turn away, then it'll, it won't it'll stop, right? So all of these different things that are not seen as private information or private or, or or being a privacy issue are becoming more to the forefront of things that need to be countered, things that need to be pushed back against. And, you know, I think the technologists um, have a responsibility to ensure these kinds of tools aren't being built, but since they are being built, we need, we need to construct ways in which we can resist against that and immunize ourselves as a society against. I think that's a great point that, you know, that we have an ethical imperative as builders of tools that coordinate human beings, emphasis on the human, right? The atomic unit of Web3 is a human being, not a wallet, not a token, not a platform. And so, you know, we in this room have an opportunity to set guardrails for ourselves. 
we are too old to, uh, to pretend that there are no negative externalities to our conjectures and suggestions. So how might you guide us to think about drawing a line around what is possible, building inside of it to minimize risk and harm to human beings. Well, one of the things that I find so fascinating is that um, when it, when it, you know, if you think about technology, if you think about it, somebody who like works, I mean, I'm using the example because I'm from the machine learning space. Um, in uh, for somebody who's working on uh, data in data science, right? Data, uh, somebody who's working in data science. Uh, it affects you know an enormous number of people with the tools that they develop and the and the data and the data sets that they work with. Um, whereas a doctor or a lawyer are held to, you know, they're held to an ethical standard, right? A doctor has the Hippocratic Oath. A lawyer has uh, the Bar Association and uh, you know various um, legal standards uh, and ethical standards that they have to do by, as a profession. So these professions are held to a higher standard, even though they're only really, you're only really working with one client as a lawyer at a time and one patient as a doctor at a time. Whereas, like as a technologist, you're essentially working on millions of people all at the same time, and yet you're not held to the same standards. Um, and I think that that is a that, that that's sort of like setting a setting technologists up to failure, for, up up for failure in, as a as a as a class as a as a as a whole field, um, you know, because you know we're really you know there there is a, there really isn't a, a a common set of standards or approaches for these things um, because you know you would never go you would never go to your doctor and say uh, or and or you would never go to your you would never go to a doctor who would say something like. Um, you know, uh, you know, like we'll just we'll just fit, break it and then fix it later, right? You know, that's you don't go to a doctor with that kind of mentality, but that's the mentality that exists in so many in so much of of the technology space. Sounds like we need a cypherpunk oath of integrity, Jaya. What do you think? Yes. Yeah. No, I agree. I actually just a funny anecdote. Um, in 2016, I think it was, I was commissioned by B9 Lab to write a Hippocratic oath for blockchain developers. <laughs> So I wrote, a, I wrote a brief Hippocratic Oath for blockchain developers and then worked with them on a, a kind of ethical um, a course as part of their blockchain developer course um, offering, so yeah. Any reminders, any, any suggestions that pulled from that oath that, uh, that we might put into practice in this room? Um, I'm trying to remember now what I wrote in there because it's actually it's quite a long time ago. But there was some there it, there was definitely one point that was on Exodus, the ability to leave a system if you need to. Um, and I think that, you know, when you're talking about decentralized, large-scale systems, that's a really important thing. Um, yeah, and then there was a whole bunch of other stuff. But I'll put, I'll put a link out to, again, and kind of revive the conversation around that. Well, in order to honor the exodus and autonomy of our users, let us remember that as we are modifying our NFTs and considering whether or not they are transferable. Um, so, you know, Jaya, surveillance capitalism obviously isn't, isn't going anywhere. So how can we leverage privacy preserving technology as an intervention into the data economy? Paint a picture for us of the two extremes here. Um, what happens if we do nothing and proceed as we are now? And what happens if we full send on protecting the sovereignty of our users? Um, well, first of all, I do hope that surveillance capitalism is going away. Um, hopefully it's not going to stick around. Uh, no, um, so I'm kind of, uh, when it comes to painting the picture of how dark things can get, um, I think what we're going to start to see is a, a kind of curious blend between data and money. Um, so if you think about money as like an access token, um, I think actually increasingly our data is going to play that role. So like if money determines like whether you can have access to resources or not, whether you can, you know, enter this or that kind of airplane or, you know, club or whatever else, um, I think there's going to be, we're going to see this kind of blend and you can see that happening also. I think like tokens are actually going to play a role here. Um, and that's also why I think this question of identity is such an important uh, question to really think clearly about what are the ethical implications around the, the, the new types of identity systems which we're building, which hopefully we're not going to build, but we're going to build something else instead. Um, but yeah, there's, I think there's going to be this blend of, of uh, you know, concepts around data and money. Data is going to start to, to function much more as money in the sense of uh, fine-grained access tokens. Um, and it's going to become more and more claustrophobic, but in quite um, insidious ways. So, you know, you know, this kind of fine-grained modulation of right now we're kind of familiar with it in terms of our experience of online, you know, advertising and online realities where, 
you know, our realities are continuously modulated on the basis of our, our you know, um, profi the profiling that's happening. And that's happening on a continuous basis, but that's going to become, I think we're going to start to see more violent sides of that, um, where it's not just the, about what advertisements you're served and which already is having quite violent effects, especially on the kind of mental health. And I know we've talked quite a bit about mental health also yes. before. Um, but actually, like, uh, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna have uh, increasingly kind of um, horrible consequences. So that's like the horror picture for me. Um, the 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 kind of uh, the bright picture of how things could be different. I think I've talked a little bit about this already in the fireside chat, but. Um, yeah, it does look like, you know, I almost picture it as like this kind of silence, right? It's like, okay, we, we implement, you know, privacy as the default and then it's like, oh, okay, we can breathe again. And then it, we can start making active, very considered decisions around what data gets produced when and how and about who um, and why and what that, that data can then be used for and to have much more control over that um, on an individual and on a collective level. Um, I mean, I, I really want to emphasize this, this thing that data is not neutral in any way whatsoever. Data is always one particular way to frame reality. Um, it's not just a kind of generic, you know, oh, it's just, it's just information about the world. It's like, no, you know, the moment you produce the data is already a decision about what matters and to who. Um, and, and that's what I want to see a much more kind of active uh, and considered uh, behavior around. And in order to do that, you need to have privacy as a default. Otherwise, you have the production of data at random, en masse, um, with you know very, very uh, violent effects that are coming. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's critical yeah. for us to to contemplate that That's, perspective. That gets down in the darker areas of my own experience. So. Yeah. The premise of credible okay. neutrality, I think, is challenged by by this idea that data inherently is political. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, as, as we move further down the stack and think about all of the, the different layers that will contribute to this future, um, you know, Chelsea, beneath the app infrastructure and network layers, how do you envision the role of secure hardware evolving in light of all of these conditions? So I think we are at a very critical time when it comes to hardware development. Um, uh, a few things are happening kind of all at the same time. Um, First, uh, there are some standards. Um, so there are now uh, there are now some architectures like RISC V that have be that have become made available um, that uh, are open source, uh, meaning that you don't have to go to a gigantic chips company uh, with a pa with a bunch of patents to ask for permission to design and develop a general purpose uh, computer chip that can run gener general software, right? Um, so RISC-V can be, uh, you know, can uh, do what an ARM, you know, chip does, uh, like the ones in your in your MacBook uh, M1s and your uh, your iPhone uh, and on your iPhone and iPad um, and your Android uh, Qualcomm devices, um, and they can do these things um, without without having, you, you can basically develop chips for this on a smaller scale with a, slow, with a smaller budget. So there's more potential innovation for smaller, develop, for smaller developers of hardware. Uh, at the same time, we've had the chip shortage, which has led to an increased demand for innovation uh, in the chip space, along with um, the fact that transistors, um, that uh, we've sort of, we've passed Moore's Law and all of these, uh, all of these manufacturers of computer chips, uh, whether whether it's uh, specialized computer chips uh, for microprocessors, or if it's uh, general purpose uh, CPUs or GP or graphics processing units or ASICs in the here in the crypto space, um, have we've reached a limit in terms of like how many transistors you can fit onto a certain amount of silicon, which has led to a need for innovation. Uh, in terms of like how things are arranged on the chip, you know, for instance, the Apple SOCs uh, have uh, Apple, the Apple M1 uh, and Apple M2 chips. Um, they move the GPU to be on the same part as right next to the CPU, right next to the um, right next to the memory, right next to everything else. So there's just a lot more efficiency. And now one of the things that you can do is you can add uh, your security. Uh, your hardware security have these encryption standard. We have we've had these encryption standards for quite some time now. Um, 
you, we already see this in ASICs where you can basically just do a lot of the same cryptographic function very efficiently and at a very significant scale, um, but with a lot more specialization in hardware as opposed to running it in, on general pur purpose uh, C on a general purpose CPU. It's faster, it's more efficient. And so all of these sort of things are, are, are happening all at once. And so it allows us to be able to develop security enclaves. It allows us to be able to develop uh, faster encryption algorithms, um, uh, portable ASICs potentially. Um, you know, obviously Helium, the, 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 the Helium um, effort, which wasn't, wasn't successful, but I think was in the right direction in terms of like having decentralized ASICs available. Um, and I sort of envision that um, there being uh, a much more distributed, uh, uh, you know, ability for people to ha be able to do very adva advanced encryption um, and have very secure encryption algorithms that work very efficiently to scale uh, on the edge of the network, on the you know, at, at the mobile, uh, at the mobile device, at the laptop, at the uh, entry point gateway uh, points on the network. Um, so there's an enormous amount of uh, potential innovation in, in terms of like being able to develop hardware, dedicated hardware, uh, or hardware that augments um, general purpose hardware with a security, you know, specialization in there. Um, so I think that the, the, this is this is a this is a, a very significant time in the fact that we are able to develop uh, actual infrastructure uh, for uh, down to the physical hardware layer and really ensure that the entire network from the uh, from down to the atom is secure. So, <laughs> sorry, I think I lost. I think I lost oh, some people. <laughs> I think it's important for us to to consider a full stack solution. And as much fun as it is to play at the application layer and as wonderful as it is for us to hang out, you know, with our close to our protocols, it is not that often that the folks in this room are invited to consider what is happening underneath. Yeah. Uh, well, I think what's what's significant is that we now have the opportunity where it was, you know, this was like an Intel level problem. This was like an Apple TSMC um, level problem. Now we have the opportunity for smaller fabrication labs, smaller developers, almost, I, I wanna, like I, I, see the, I, I see the possibility of there being the closest thing to 3D printing the chip space in the next decade or two because of the chip shortage, because of uh, new uh, open source uh, architectures being made available. Um, there is an, an enormous amount of uh, innovation that, that is possible. And I think, and I, you know, I'm really excited about you know, the kinds of tools and technologies that we're gonna see, especially given the fact that everything, the entire, uh, tech, the entire hardware industry is going to SOCs. So I think, you know, we, we three at least agree that everyone should care about the fundamental need for online privacy and security and whatever that looks like in our new flavors of the internet. Um, but the reality is that more often than not, everyday consumers are not willing to sacrifice convenience to prioritize their privacy because it's hard to feel the loss of privacy when you're giving up one piece of data at a time, when you're filling out one event bright at a time to go to parties. Um, and you know, Nim, Nim states that privacy should simply be the default of the internet. So how can we incentivize and inspire the builders in this room to prioritize the safety of our users fundamental right to privacy without sacrificing user experience? And you know, what do we risk if we fail to seriously consider these trade-offs right now with what we're building? I mean, that's why it's so important to think about what privacy can actually afford. I mean, like what, what you know, positives can come out of uh, privacy-preserving infrastructures rather than just seeing it as a kind of patch uh, you know, to try and prevent, you know, harms. Um, we really need to think about what are the kind of things that privacy enables um, and to be much more forward looking in that sense. Because, you know, the, the issue of privacy has been, you know, something that a handful of people have worried about for like the past, you know, few decades um, and are trying to get everyone else to, okay, use PGP or whatever else, you know, like for a long time. And it's, you know, it, it just hasn't been that easy um, to convince people exactly because, 
um, it is actually quite complicated. Like it's quite complicated to preserve your privacy when you're when you're engaging with digital technologies. Um, in fact, for the vast majority of people, it's it's pretty impossible. And that's why, again, it's why we you know from NIM's perspective, it's a collective problem that needs to be addressed at the collective layer. And that's why we keep um, insisting on infrastructure. Um, and that's also why, you know, when it comes to using the mixed net, we do expect that there's going to be, you know, some uh, people that are that will be interested in using the, the mixed net just off their own kind of bat. But actually, we're betting much more on a kind of B2B scenario um, where the mixed net is integrated into the everyday applications that people are already using. Because to add the extra uh, worry, you know, in people's lives that it's, you know, they have to take the, the decision to add privacy to their, to their everyday kind of digital interactions is just adding more stress to everybody's lives that are already pretty stressful given the, the situation that most of us are living in today. Um, and so it needs to be something that's baked into the things that people are trying to achieve in their everyday lives already. Um. It's also not hypothetical, right? It's, you know, there are actual people who need the, who this, who this serves as, a, as an immediate need, activists on the ground in all of these different places, whether it's, uh, you know, the, uh, w whether it's the abortion bans in America, whether it's, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the Ukraine-Russia war, um, whether it is, uh, you know, w w whether it's surveillance uh, in a country like China or Iran, right? There are immediate needs for people, uh, and I think that it's I think that it's unfair um, for us as technologists to ask or to demand individuals make these kinds of decisions or have this kind of knowledge. Um, I, I I find it very unfair that um, you know people have already started blaming sort of activist failures in the United States in particular whenever it comes to abortion stuff uh, for not protecting people's privacy enough. But it's like, you know, if you if you are somebody who has just had your entire life, like, and your entire expectation, your entire paradigm changed overnight um, by, uh, by an institution that, you know, just completely pulled the rug out from underneath you, um, do you, are you expected to suddenly have 30 years of a knowledge of security and experience, are you expected to instantly be an expert in this field and to do everything correctly and to do everything to the maximal ex extent possible to, uh, to protect yourself against st potentially state actors, state level actors? And you know, the, the, the truth is that you know, we, can't, we can't ask individuals who have never had a background in this field to, to all of a sudden just, you know, completely change their entire life because, uh, because their threat model has changed all of a sudden. Um, it's also unfair to assume that people don't care about privacy. Uh, and in actual fact, I think the, the adoption of, you know, Signal shows that if you make something that's usable and privacy preserving, people will go for that rather than the other options. And, and that's just something that we need to kind of... Um, uh, you know, understand and not always see it as like, oh, people don't care enough, you know, this and that. It's actually like the vast majority of people would preserve, prefer privacy-preserving technologies, um, but they need to be usable, you know. Yeah, usability is just as much of a blocker to ad the adoption of Web3 as technical scaling and some of the other problems that we might be more, more familiar with. Child should be able to use an encryption. So as we are democratizing access to encryption and contemplating everything that we've discussed here today, um, just want to thank ETH Berlin for hosting us. Thank you both so much for coming here and, and having this wonderful conversation. I have one more thing. Yes. These, this fire's fake. I'm just kind of... <laughs> I can't.